Good afternoon, everybody. If you're on the East Coast, it is now 1230. And we are here with some really special guests. Um, if you didn't know, this week is Aortic Dissection Awareness Week. And we are here with the John Ritter Foundation for Aortic Health uh, to talk to you all about aortic dissection and what the needs of that patient population is so that we can be better visitors and supporters for that population. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Meredith O'Neill, who is the executive director at the John Ritter Foundation. Um, Meredith, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. I'm so excited about our partnership that we have. It's been such a pleasure getting to know you guys. And I'm an official member of my local chapter here in Dallas, Texas of the Mended Hearts chapter. So shout out to the Dallas Plano chapter of Mended Hearts. Um, for they're, they're so active and they're so wonderful. So, um, well, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna give a quick little overview of aortic dissection and That's aneurysm, why you should care and what we're doing about it. So in my sales training, I know that, you know, fit fundraising is a little bit like sales, right? So they always told us why, how, need, and what, you know, why do you do what you do? How do you do it? What's the need still? And what can I do to help? So um, why? Why aortic dissection? What, why is it important? So aortic dissection and aneurysm, your aorta is your largest artery coming out of your heart, and it takes oxygen-rich blood to all of your major organs in your body. And an aneurysm is when the, the aorta starts bubbling. It looks like this. And a dissection can happen from an aneurysm or it can happen without an aneurysm. But what it is, is you have three layers on, in your aorta. You know, it's kind of a fail safe. And just like the Titanic, it's supposed to be an unsinkable ship, but sometimes it can sink. And the way that happens is that a dissection is when one or two of those layers starts ripping and blood goes in between those layers. That's called a false lumen. And what's dangerous about that is many things. First of all, it can cut off that oxygen rich blood to what, to your limbs, to your kidneys, to your liver, to even your brain, because there is a major, your carotid comes off of your aorta. So it's really, really dangerous. And the second thing that's so dangerous is it could be a rupture. And if a rupture happens, you can bleed out extremely quickly. And it is very, very fatal. 50% of people don't even make it to the hospital if they end up having an aortic dissection. So what are we here for? Why, why the, so why, how, need, and what? So how are we addressing it? The mission of the um, John Ritter Foundation for Aortic Health is to raise awareness of thoracic aortic dissection and aneurysm through research, education, and advocacy. So the need is, is that we're still considered rare. We're still considered a rare disease. But you know, I'm, I'm looking at my computer screen because I was pulling up some, um, some statistics and there are between 15,000 and 25,000 cases of aortic dissection annually in the USA that are reported. Unfortunately, this is the great, um, it looks like something, the great imitator. It, low, it can look like a heart attack. For me, it just looked like um, pregnancy problems. And so it's, it's really hard to diagnose. And if you don't have a, if unfortunately they don't make it to the hospital and you don't have an autopsy, sometimes it can be misdiagnosed in the hospital. It can be misdiagnosed. So it's not as rare as you think, and there is ways to outwit it. And so what we're trying to do is get the education out there, not only to the patients, but also to their families and to medical providers so that not only can the patients advocate for themselves, but any medical provider, whether it's a patient tech, all the way up to the head of the department can see, recognize and treat an aortic dissection. So what are the risks? The risks are if you have a family um, history, whether they're syndromes like Marfan, um, Ehlers-Danlos, um, Lois Dietz, if, so I'm the fifth dissection in four generations in my family. So that's a familial disease. We don't quite know the genetic causes. Um, smoking, uncontrolled high blood pressure, 
um, a bicuspid aortic valve, any of these things put you at risk. So we I encourage you to get imaged. We encourage you to get screened. We encourage you to do clinical genetic testing if you've had an aortic dissection and have all of your first degree family members screened also for genetic um, issues, but also get your aorta screened either through CT or echocardiogram. And I myself am a survivor and I had a dissection almost four years ago and um, just so glad to be here. And I know that during my journey and my stay with a baby in a hospital for six days, the visitors, uh, you're just so thirsty for information about what happened to you. So we're really grateful for Minded Hearts and what you do. Thank you. Thank you for that overview. Um, we appreciate the information, but now we want to hear from Donald, Donald Schwartz, who is also an aortic dissection survivor, part of the John Ritter Foundation, but he is also a member of Mended Hearts. Um, so Donald, I am going to introduce you. We'd love to hear from you about your experience and um, what our visitors can take away from how they can help others in your situation. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea, uh, Meredith, and uh, the, the entire team over at uh, Mended Hearts uh, and uh, the JRF. Wonderful work that we, that we all do. Um, yes, I dissected actually four years ago uh, yesterday and um, very easily could have been misdiagnosed as just a heart attack, but I, I asked the right questions. The doctors in the emergency room asked the right questions and took the right tests and uh, identified that I was actually dissecting. Uh, otherwise, uh, like John Ritter, I would have gone home and probably had a, uh, an, a, an unfortunate and unnecessary demise. Um, but when I did get out of the hospital um, and I got involved in cardiac rehab, um, I met many people uh, in the New York City Mended Hearts chapter. Uh, they convinced me to, uh, to join their, uh, their support group that met weekly. Uh, I did that. Uh, it was wonderful, a very, very, a great bunch of people uh, share a lot of information, very comforting, uh, very uh, cathartic to, to, to everyone there to be able to help each other. Um, and from there, I met uh, a, a visitor, uh, uh, someone who would go to the cardiac floors at NYU and visit with uh, the patients. Um, I went, uh, first I had to get vetted uh, by NYU, very thorough. Uh, I did a lot of uh, testing and um, uh, learning uh, from the Mended Hearts uh, literature that they sent out uh, to prepare someone to, uh, to be a, an accredited visitor. And, um, and I went and I was a mentor uh, with this other person. Her name is Bonnie, an angel. She is truly an angel from the New York City uh, chapter. Um, and we went and we were... Uh, we visited and it was wonderful, it was a wonderful experience. And I got to the point of being able to do it on my own and I visit between five and 10 people an evening, uh, two to three times a week. And um, I was, wasn't just visiting the people, but it was it, more times than not, there were caregivers in the room uh, and I would speak with the caregivers and comfort them and, and, and a lot of listening. Um, it's uh, not medical advice by any stretch of the imagination. It's purely listening and sharing my experiences, uh, showing the before and after, uh, telling them that not more than four months ago, I was in that bed and, uh, and someone was coming to talk to me. And uh, it, was, uh, it was just a wonderful experience. Um, I, I would recommend it for everybody and anybody who has been in, in my shoes or in, in Meredith's shoes, uh, it's something where uh, it helps, it shows that there is a normal life after, uh, or uh, there is a life after uh, dissection. Uh, and uh, maybe it's a, you're a new normal, but there is a very normal life after any cardiac issue. I was actually the only dissection patient I had ever met in the hospital. Um, like Meredith had mentioned, not many of us do survive. Uh, but I met with trans so many transplants and so many uh, other cardiac disease. Um, but it was 
it, it, it allowed, us, allowed me to share uh, the Mended Hearts literature, uh, which was extremely thorough. It allowed me to discuss uh, cardiac rehab, which is pushed hard by uh, the Mended Hearts group, which I thought was a lifesaver for me uh, to get back into the gym and to exercise under the guidance and, and observation of nurses and doctors. And, um, and, the, and the, the support groups, and the support groups, not only again for the patients, but for the caregivers. And they drill down to support groups for caregivers who had dissect, uh, who helped people with dissections, support groups for people who had uh, transplants. It really, it, it drills down to whatever you need for your specific situation uh, and uh, the res makes resources available to you so that you can, you can breathe a little easier and get some of your questions answered because you do have a lot of questions. So I would recommend everybody to get involved it, uh, and, and visit. It's, it, it helps you and, and more than you think, and it certainly helps the people that you're talking to. Thank you. I know that you've been passionate about visiting and, and giving back. And um, my question for both of you, and if anybody out there listening would like to ask any questions, you can put them in the Q&A box or I will ask the questions for you. But my question for both of you is, once you found out that you had this aortic dissection, um, where what was the first thing that you felt feel now that you needed? Like what was really vital at that point for you? How did I know I was dissecting? No, like what did you need right after the diagnosis during that crisis period? Was there something you needed that you can look back on and say, man, it would have been really nice to have something? My situation was bang, bang, bang. It was, uh, I, I was at behind my desk having lunch. I thought I was having a heart attack. Uh, I rushed to the emergency room. They ran a couple of tests and they rushed me to, to surgery. So I was, uh, no, there was nothing that I, I, I remember now thinking that I needed except for my wife and my family to be by my side. Um, and maybe, maybe more to tell me, tell me what was going on. I think maybe it would, would have been, you know, somewhat, uh, helpful to have to have someone you know just talk to me a little bit about what was happening other than this is what's going on and this is what you need and we'll see in eight hours. Meredith so do most patients is it mostly a critical event um, and then it's handled very quickly and and the surgery happens. Um, this isn't a progressive disorder, correct? Correct. So there are two different types of aortic dissection that we talk about regularly. Um, so, well, first of all, they're broken up into two major categories. You have abdominal, which is a lot more common, and then thoracic, which is what we are more um, focused on as the John Ritter Foundation for Aortic Health. And within thoracic, there is two different types of dissections. There's type A and type B. There's ascending and descending. Ascending, the, the clock starts ticking. The minute that they see that you have an ascending aortic dissection, the clock starts ticking and they have to get you into an ER, I'm sorry, an OR to fix and repair the, um, the dissection. Because otherwise there's, it's right off of your heart and it's just pumping blood so hard, the tear can get bigger and bigger and, and then a rupture as I spoke about earlier. But back to your question about something that you thought that you needed um, in between. I, and I am not sure if everyone is a faithful person but for me, what really helped, I had 14 minutes in between when they made the decision to send me to a different hospital and when my care flight arrived. And the chaplain came in at that time and spoke to me and Kyle, who's my husband. And what was really helpful for that for me was they knew the questions that could help my husband and I get through the answers that we needed to talk about in such a short amount of time with, um, unfortunately, this is an incredibly fatal condition. And so the, um, the, the chance of surviving is, you know, it's just dependent on your situation. So in that 14 minutes, they were able to say like, you need to say goodbye to each other and gave us words and gave me comfort. And we prayed, which was important to me 
and my husband at the time. And so for me, that was a really critical piece um, to give me peace um, before I got on the helicopter. That's fabulous that you were able to have that short time, but that time with somebody who really knew how to drive that conversation. Right. So I have a question for Donald from the audience. Um, you mentioned that there was a difference between a heart, like a heart attack and the aortic dissection. Do you know the questions that the doctor asked you that made you realize it was a dissection versus a heart attack? Well, when I went to the emergency room of the small local hospital near my office, uh, they I, I went in saying, telling them that I think I'm having a heart attack. I was having severe chest pains and back pain and and I never had a heart attack before, but that, that's what I assumed was, was happening. Um, they were wonderful. They did all their tests and they were happy to report back that I was, was not having a heart attack, that it must be in digestion or something else, but I wasn't having a heart attack. And that's when fortunately, um, I had mentioned to them that I had a, a history of a slightly enlarged aorta but nothing of any danger that has been monitored. And the emergency room uh, cardiologist was smart enough and fast enough and on his feet to insist, based upon me sharing my information, he insisted that I take a CAT scan. And that's when all hell broke loose. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's so important, right, for the patient to be able to share all of the information and the important information with doctors, even if you don't think it makes a difference, right? Because, you know, maybe it doesn't make a difference, but maybe it's very, very important, just like with you. Um, the next question is, uh, Jan says, my dissection was associated with me being of childbearing years and hormones. Can you discuss, you know, Meredith, you had your dissection while you were pregnant? Yes, I did. Um, well, Diane, um, thank you for sharing your story. We are very grateful and, um, you know, glad you're here. We're so glad you're here because dissection is, uh, can feel like a lonely disease, a lonely condition. So you are not alone. So um, when you say it was related to um, being childbearing years and hormones, I'd love to dig deeper into that with you, but I'm just going to kind of give an overall answer to this but please feel free to reach out to me at info at johnritterfoundation.org to speak more about this. But if you have a dissection earlier than 60 years old, we highly, highly, highly recommend that you get genetic clinical genetic testing performed to see if any of the genetic markers that we have found um, have caused your aortopathy. That's what it's called. It's aortopathy, genetic causes of aortopathy. Um, I mentioned it earlier, there are syndromes related to it, but there are also malformations like ACTA2, the LOX gene that can lead to aortic dissection in patients. But myself, um, I don't know what my aortic dissection genetic malformation is, but I'm the fifth dissection in four generations. So we do know it's something. Pregnancy caused my dissection because I had high blood pressure brought on by pregnancy. So it was my trigger, but I was genetically predisposed to having a dissection at some point in my life. And so, um, or being at risk of having a dissection. So um, I would encourage you to get in touch with the John Ritter Foundation to figure out maybe a genetic cause. And then because you dissected so young, we do suspect that it is probably a genetic cause and we need to be monitoring your first degree relatives, like your parents, your siblings, and your children. Fabulous, thank you. Um, so somebody is asking, what are the specific primary symptoms? Great question. Donald, do you want to talk about what your primary symptoms were? Uh, I truly didn't have. I didn't have any symptoms. I had, as I mentioned to you, um, I had a uh, slightly enlarged aorta um, for many years that was always under observation and never a concern to any of the cardiologists or any of the physicians that, that well, examined me. Um, I, ha I had nothing. I, uh, after my dissection, uh, 
through the uh, the John Ritter Research uh, uh, Group. Uh, they they tested me. They tested me uh, uh, for my genetic disposition, and I did not have. Uh, we, they went. I went back, and my father, thank God, he's still alive, and we tested him, and he he did not have. My children has been tested, and thank God, they do not have. So, you know, the the the, the, the reason I'm I, I dissected is still unknown. Possibly weightlifting. I, I uh, I've been told that 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 can cause a dissection, um, but uh, no, I I I don't know why. But that day, it definitely felt like a, a heart attack, right? Like you had a pain in your chest, and I would have I would have bet that I was having a heart attack. That's right. Mine, That's... it felt like a tearing in the chest, and then it uh, radiated to my back, and I had severe back pain. But I was also pregnant. And another thing that can happen is it can feel like really bad heartburn um, and you can have ischemia where what one or more of your limbs goes numb because the blood flow isn't. So my right leg went numb. Um, my grandfather felt like he was having really horrible um, indigestion. My mother felt like she was having a heart attack. Her left arm went numb. So again, it's the great imitator, right? And I worked for American Heart Association. We've done a great job of telling people um, but if you have those, just think about your aorta as well. So, Donald, yours was a, th um, a thoracic dissection, right? That's correct. Mine, mine was ascending uh, thoracic, uh, type A ascending thoracic, yes. Okay. I know we're running out of time, but I have one more question. Um, does an echo have the capability of showing a thinning of the aorta wall, or does it just measure the dilation of the aorta? That is a great question. And I'm not a doctor, but from what I have heard from presentations, I've never asked this question specifically to a doctor, but they all say a CT is the gold standard to figure out the size of your aorta and the shape that it is in. So an echo is really the reason we tell people to go get an echo done is that's kind of the first flag that raises. So when you get an echo, I think they're really just looking for a dilation um, and seeing if there is an issue, and then they'll take you for further testing. They won't do a, a definite diagnosis just from an echo. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for our quick little visiting vignette. We will be back next month with some other um, amazing people, but today the John Ritter Foundation and Mended Heart are so excited to be able to partner together to bring support and education and awareness to this really important disease. Um, we have some new stuff coming out with a, um, a discussion guide on aortic dissection and lots of other great stuff to come. So everybody, thank you for joining us. Meredith, Donald, thank you for spending some time with us today. Thank you, um, thank you for all the great work that you, you and your group do. Yes, we're, we're honored to work with you. Yes, thank you. And everybody have a great day and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Andrea. Bye. Thanks, Donald. Thank you, Meredith.